Thirsty for intelligent sports talk? Sounds like you need a little go to Ray. 1033 The Goat. The greatest sports talk of all time. Great Scott! The Great Scott Show. And as they head into the final furlong, all of the other radio stations and radio hosts are left in the wake of a keen turn of speed by the Great Scott Show, the champion. With Scott Prather. Steal the show. Show coming at you on a Tuesday morning after the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, I don't even know, you know, beat down, crush, dominate. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how you those those words just don't do justice to define what unfolded last night. At SoFi Stadium in L.A., it was the worst ever blowout in a championship game ever, ever in football. I asked the question on Twitter last night. Can you remember a more dominant, more lopsided win in the history of college football in a championship game? And the answer is there's never been one. Not only that, it was the biggest blowout in any bowl game ever. Ever. Think about that. The biggest game of the season, the game that ESPN wants everyone to stay tuned into, keep watching. I was watching the Pelicans for good chunk of it because you know you could kind of see what was happening pretty pretty early in that game i mean uh, and tcu to their credit they got there oh they don't deserve to be there yeah they deserve to be there well they weren't the second best team it's about it's not always about the best it's about who deserves to be there they beat the number two team they they did what they were supposed to be but i mean they 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 acknowledged it after the game they acknowledged it after the game. Said, you know what? That's uh, we we were outclassed. We we're just not in the same tier. TCU head coach Sonny Dykes acknowledged as much after his team lost sixty-five to seven to the Bulldogs in the college football playoff title game. You made it to the national championship game, but you fell short. What did you say to your team when you entered the locker room? Well, obviously, you got to give Georgia a ton of credit. I mean, they showed what kind of football program they have, and we've got some players over there that are pretty special. And, um, you know, obviously, we didn't do a great job getting our guys prepared. We've been on a heck of a run, and it seemed like we just ran out of steam a little bit tonight. And, you know, again, you got to give your hats off to Georgia and, and what they did. And, obviously, we uh, got to improve. You know, our goal is to get back on the stage like this, and, you know, we're going to have to roll our sleeves up, go to work, and, and uh, still have a long way to go uh, before we're ready to compete. But I'm really proud of our guys for what they've done. You know, to come this far in a year is pretty remarkable, and got a lot of guys in that locker room that are hurt right now. Yeah, your quarterback, Max Duggan, just walked out of the locker room in tears. What has he meant to you and to this program? Well, just a special guy. We're just telling Max, you know, I've got a six-year-old son, and I hope, hope he grows up to be like Max someday. And, you know, that's a pretty good compliment for Max, and it's true. You know, it just... He's just a warrior, a battler, and, you know, none of us played our best tonight. We didn't, certainly didn't coach our best. and But, you know, it's been unbelievable what he's been to TCU football and, um, you know, couldn't be more proud of him. What are the positives that you'll take away from this run and the foundation that it creates for TCU moving forward? Well, you know, obviously this was disappointing performance tonight. Um, we've got to look in the mirror and see what we did wrong and see what we have to get corrected. And that always starts with me and, you know, figuring out um, – you know, the next time, so with so that this doesn't happen, next time we're on a stage like this. and um, But we had a heck of a run. I mean, we really, really played well and just continued to gain confidence. And, 
you know, won some games that we probably shouldn't have along the way, and, and our players just continued to believe. And, you know, tonight was not our night, but we'll, uh, we'll regroup and go from there. Yeah. I, I, I look at a team like TCU, and you, you try not to let last night's outcome impact how you view the entire season. It was a magical year for them. It was a magical ride. And maybe the fact that they were an underdog, maybe the fact that they were 5-7 and seven last year, maybe the fact that no one expected them to be in the position that they were in last night heading into that game as a team that was not ranked in the preseason, maybe that will be the catalyst to allow them with time to look back and say, man, what a magical ride. But there is no way you can do that the morning after losing by 58 points. Biggest blowout in a national championship game of all time. Number two on that list was USC beating Oklahoma 55-19. to Number three was when Bama beat Notre Dame and all the talk was about Manti Teo. And, you know, off the field. Bama won that one 42-14 in 2012. In 2001, Miami beat Nebraska 37-14. In 2018, remember when Clemson just in Santa Clara, California, with one of those West Coast games, beat the snot out of Alabama 44-16? That is the fifth biggest blowout in national championship game history. 06, Tim Tebow, Florida, 41-14 over Ohio State. And then in 2020, Alabama beat Ohio State 52-24. to Those are your 10 biggest blowouts in national championship game history. But the thing is, it, it wasn't just that. In any bowl game ever. And so when you get beat that way, it's hard to keep some things in perspective. <clears throat> In 2011, LSU was not an underdog like TCU. LSU was not preseason unranked. LSU was not this, yeah, I don't don't know. Where are they coming from? You know, they were expected to be good, and then they were better than good. Defensively and on special teams, they were as good as it gets. Offensively, they had some problems, but they were able to overcome it all year, and they won, and then they won again, and they kept winning, and they were dominating teams, and Tyron Matthew was uh, invited to the... Heisman ceremony where he was a finalist and they were just dominating really good teams. There was talk of, man, is this best team ever? Look at who they've beaten. And in the old BCS format, Oklahoma State lost a game to Iowa State on a weird night where a field goal was in and it wasn't. It was a Friday night game. There was tragedy earlier that week. There was a lot surrounding that game and they had one loss. And Alabama had one loss, which they lost to LSU. But they got back in the national championship game, and they beat LSU 21 to nothing. And if you watch that game, it wasn't even close. It was, it's not on this list of top 10 blowouts, but it, it, as far as just lopsided competitiveness, it, it could have been, it should have been. It is. And the reason I'm bringing that up, and I'm not trying to bring up, you know, bad memories for LSU fans, is is to highlight the point that, you know, Tiger fans will always look back at 2019 and 2003 in very special ways. How many LSU fans, how many of you look back at 2011 and just smile and remember a 9-6 win in Tuscaloosa and remember the exciting season that was? Remember Tyron Matthew just going Tecmo Super Bowl, Bo Jackson-esque on punt return against Georgia in the SEC championship game? Like, do you remember the great moments from that season? Or when you think about it, do you just kind of get a nasty feeling in the pit of your stomach and get upset that at the Superdome, you know, Bama beat LSU 21 to nothing in a national title game. My point is, as great as the season is, when you lose on the biggest stage in that fashion, it's hard to look back and compartmentalize. I think TCU will be able to do it because it was a season that no one expected. But had they lost by a point to Michigan and just missed out on getting to the national title game, I I feel like they would look back at the season even sweeter than they will. 
I think they'll look back at the season and say, "It's say, you know, man, we were so close to getting into the natty, and who knows if we'd gotten in. I mean, anything's possible. And now they're the runner-up instead of finishing, what, third or fourth, or however they break them. I guess in the final polls, the pollsters probably would have put them in fourth. But maybe you look back at it a little sweeter. Yeah, there's heartbreak with the loss to Michigan, but I, I don't even know what you described last night. I mean, it, it, three first-half turnovers forced by Georgia. It's 38-7 to seven at the half. It's the largest margin of victory ever against a team ranked in the AP Top 4. They outgained TCU by over 400 yards. 589 to 188. Stetson Bennett, one time Rage of Cajun commit, threw four touchdown passes, ran for two more. What a magical career that guy's had. And now they won back to back titles. And now, even though it doesn't have the same ring as we won, Bama, da, 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 da. now crowds need to start chanting, We want Georgia after they get a big win. That's what they need to do. Because Georgia is the best program in college football. Two straight natties. They got another group of, excuse me. Phew. Excuse me. Gesundheit. They have another group of first rounders that'll go in the NFL draft. And of all of Nick Saban's protégés, Kirby Smart seems to be the one that has figured out how to get get to that level. I mean, Stetson Bennett, it wasn't until signing day. Georgia has a key quarterback transfer. They're like, you know what? You were at JUCO. I know you really, really wanted to come here. You grew up in Georgia. You dreamed of being a dog. I know you're committed to that Billy Napier guy at UL, but now that we have an open spot in our quarterback room, how about you come on as a preferred walk-on? And he did, and he wasn't even the starter to begin the 2021 title run, and and everyone kept doubting him, and they said, well, he shouldn't do this, and he shouldn't do that. He's not considered a top prospect at the NFL level. And yet all he did was earn the starting job and win a national title and then did it again and was huge in that final game-winning drive against Michigan and last night was responsible for six touchdowns. And he doesn't have to buy a drink in the state of Georgia again. And here's the other thing about Georgia. They are the betting favorite to win the title again next year. I mean, look at their schedule. Look, go, go, go take a gander at Georgia's schedule next year. Tell me where the loss is. Well, maybe if they get to the SEC title game and this and that. They're, they got UT Martin, Ball State, South Carolina, UAB. Four home games to start the season, four wins. They're at Auburn. Then they have Kentucky at home. Then they're at Vanderbilt. Then they're off. Then they have Florida in neutral field. Then they have Missouri. Then they have Ole Miss. Then they're at Tennessee. Then they have Georgia Tech. They're going to be favored by a ton in every one of those games. Every one of them. No one, this is wild, no one in the history of college football has finished three consecutive seasons at number one in the AP poll. No one. Not, not, not in college football title history. Back before they, you know, did the, they had multiple titles, they had three championships, depending on what poll was what, like Minnesota in like the 30s had a, had a, a dominant stretch there. We're going back to the 30s. You, you might as well, I mean, well, it was football. It was, it was basically a different sport. <laughs> oh, man. And, and, and if you're Ohio State and Michigan, how can you not look at last night's game and be like, we, we, were, we were so close? 
Because if you're Ohio State, you're saying, we should have beaten Georgia. We had them. We outplayed them. And there's no way we would have lost the TCU. And if you're Michigan, you're sitting there saying, how did we lose the TCU? And yeah, Ohio State and Michigan, a rematch in the national title game. Some folks in the South might not have liked it. It would have been a better game than what we saw last night. Because if you're not a Georgia fan and you weren't just waiting and waiting and waiting for the over that finally hit when Bowers scored a touchdown, if you were just hoping to watch without any betting interest, you didn't get a good game. You didn't get a good game. Seventeen after the hour. It's the Great Scott Show. One hundred three three. The Goat simulcast on fourteen twenty. That was your national title game last night. Dominance and a little bit of a snooze fest. We're going to talk some. UL Hoops this morning. Coach Bob Marlin going to be on with me at 745 on the phone line. We'll have a conversation with Coach Broadhead as well. Jay Walker is going to be in studio in the 8 o'clock hour. We'll take a look at uh, the, the college football season officially done, wrapped in the books. We'll talk college hoops. We'll do a little Terrible Tune Tuesday. We'll talk NFL playoffs. Playoffs? Playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? We will do all of that. This morning for you on the show. Phone lines are open for you as well. 337-269-1077. You can email me. Scott at 1033thegoat.com. Simple. I would say you can tweet us. I'm trying to log in here, but uh, having issues here. Now it's asking me to create an account. Well, that doesn't work. And I can look at it on the phone. Hey, how about Dustin Poirier? So we shift gears for a second now. I want to. I want to. I want to give Dustin a lot of credit that might seem like something easy to do. Something he did, but that's not always the case, is it? See, I had a caller yesterday that brought up ESPN's coverage of the video of Dana White, president and CEO of of the UFC, slapping his wife, Ann, at a nightclub on New Year's Eve. Well, she kind of slapped him first, and then he slapped her several times really hard and all this other stuff. It was a very, very, very bad look. Very bad look. And he slapped her with a lot more force and he pushed her on the ground. And, you know, I I don't want to get into uh, it. It was bad. It was wrong. It was wrong. And the caller said, man, ESPN, they, they didn't really, they needed, it's ridiculous. They barely covered it at all. And whenever you have a multi-million dollar contract with an organization and your business partners in some ways and you work together and UFC port brings money into ESPN and ESPN brings money in they didn't really call them out all that much it's the idea that you know when an owner in sports does something it gets a little coverage and when a player does it it's you know the news cycle and my point is a lot of you would say oh it should be it's easy to call out Dana White right when you're a, a, a in, in uh, an independent contractor, essentially, but have made a lot of your money and certainly elevated your profile through UFC, maybe you're not as quick to call out the guy in charge of it. Not the case with Dana White. Very succinct, very to the point. You should never put your hands on a woman. Pretty simple. Well, that's what you're supposed to say. Well, I mean, how many fighters in the UFC are coming out and saying that? How many fighters that have the platform, prestige, cachet, like Dustin Poirier does, have come out and said it? He said, look, it's not a good look for sure. 
You should never put your hands on a woman. I mean, I'm with you, Dustin. Dana White once said in 2014, there's one thing you never bounce back from, and that's putting your hands on a woman. Been that way in the UFC since we started here. You don't bounce back from putting your hands on a woman. Dana White said that eight and a half years ago. Uh, UFC has made no official statement about it, and ESPN has kind of just showed a video and then went silent. Shocking. Not really. 22 after the hour. Derek emails. Scott, do you think Georgia's back-to-back titles make them a dynasty? That's a good question, Derek. We get back to college football for a second. Georgia was... Huh. You know, for a long time, Georgia was really good but not good enough. They were always good, but not... They're always a supporting player. They weren't the name above the title. You know, they were always coming up just short. Not the case anymore. When you think of dynasties in college football, you think of Bama, you think of Miami Stretch, you think of Nebraska... But Georgia, man, winning back-to-back and having the most lopsided bowl win ever, well, you need to win more than just two. Okay, but they're the fourth team since 1990 to go back-to-back. Nebraska did it. I'm sorry, what? uh, Well, USC did it if you count their AP title. Bama did it. Miami did it. Like, it's not a long list. Consider that this team lost 15 players to the 2022 NFL draft. Think about that for a minute. I mean, LSU lost so many after 2019. Bunch of first rounders and uh, wasn't great in 2020. Georgia lost 15 players to the draft. They came back the next year and they won the title and went undefeated. I mean, they gave up 188 yards last night. And you could say, oh man, they, they were they they did look tired on New Year's Eve against Ohio State. But many thought it was gonna be, you know, a slight step back. Kirby Smart, despite the fact that he looks as college football can age you. Guys, Kirby Smart is only 47 years old. That's it. He's only 47. I I, I, I think you do need to. The easy, the easy answer to this question is, well, if they win one next year, then 100% yes, but they're not there yet. Yeah. They've been so close for a while, so they've been really good, and now they've won back-to-back. They've gotten to the title game. I mean, you don't necessarily have to win back-to-back-to-back. You just have to be in the mix consistently and win several over a couple years. I'm sorry, Clemson. You know, they they, they being in the title games that they were, and then winning some of them. It wasn't like Clemson had to win three in a row. They just had to win some and be in the mix. If people consider Clemson a dynasty. They, they, they've only won two titles in the last seven years. They've only won three ever, but they were consistently in the national championship game. They were consistently in the college football playoff. Georgia, you could argue, has a better resume in the last seven, eight years than Clemson. So, yeah, I will say, yes, I do think they are a current dynasty in college football. I do. I do. God, how good is Brock Bowers? My goodness. That tight end, holy cow. Sheesh. 
I mean, he, he, he could go start and be a pro bowler in the NFL today. Today. Sophomore, by the way. 26 after the hour. We mentioned it, Bob Marlin coming up at 745. We'll talk a little. College hoops, Rage of Cajuns. Coming off back-to-back victories. We'll get into that. Rage of Cajun women's basketball coach Gary Broadhead coming up shortly as well. We'll talk to him for a few minutes. They're coming off a 20-point road win at Texas State. Jay Walker will be in studio. Looking forward to that. Haven't talked to Jay in a little bit. We'll take a quick time out here on the Great Scott Show. When we come back, we'll visit with Coach Broadhead, and then we'll talk to Coach Marlin at 745. Your weather forecast for today from the Storm Team 3 Weather Lab and Dave Baker, a mix of clouds and sun, cool with a high of 72 tonight, partly cloudy with a low of a 65. Um, oh, let's see. Vehicle accidents. Vehicle accident reported uh, 20 minutes ago at the corner of South College and Collie Saloon. That's like, you know, I know it's confusing as far as South College goes, but the extension is like over there, kind of by that, past that that strip that has like firehouse subs. In the, anyway, be careful. Also, a vehicle accident reported. Uh, at East College Saloon Road and South College Road. So there are a couple of spots right there in the same location. Um, If you can avoid that area, you might want to drive around it for the time being. Take a quick time out. We'll come back. What's the key to winning on the road in college sports? How hard is it? We'll get into that with Coach Broadhead. We will circle back to the uh, national championship game Put a ribbon on the college football season that was 2022. Pels get a 20-point win last night on the road. Highest scoring output of the season. No Zion, no B.I., but a game they really needed to have, and they got it. But joining me now, the head basketball coach of the Rage of Cajun Women's Basketball Team. Coming off of a 20-point road victory. That's how you bounce back. Uh, they beat Texas State 71-51 to following a, a heartbreaker last week uh, in Hattiesburg where they lost in the final moments by a point. Uh, Coach Broadhead, our guest. Coach, good morning, man. Uh, how are you? And I, I, you and I haven't chatted in a while, and I was out a little bit here and there. So uh, very belated on my part. But first off, Happy New Year, man. How you doing? Happy New Year. Doing great, man. It's great to be back, you know, kind of getting in the flow. We're getting ready to start school on Wednesday. So, you know, hey be a lot of a lot of fun you know it's good to be back though but uh yeah everything's going good you know holidays are over really enjoyed them and i think uh hopefully we're as healthy as we've been so hopefully we can get going yeah uh and you three of your next four are are on are at home uh you got south alabama tomorrow then you're at troy then old dominion and arkansas state but the way the schedule played out coach you have a thursday game in hattiesburg and then you fly to San Marcos. It's tough to win on the road in, in, in college hoops, and you guys were able to do it by 20 points. What was, what was in your mind, the biggest key to that? Uh, I just think our defense, man. We really, I mean, we held them to 23 points at half. Now, we only scored 24 at half, but, you know, you hold a team that's averaging 68 points a game to, to 23 at half, and it, it becomes frustrating. You know, I had an old coach told me that all the time. When you score and it's easy to defend, and when you're not, uh, can you get your team to defend, you know? And I think that's what happened to them. You know, they came out the third, and we started hitting shots and kind of getting going. And we still were – I think they scored six points the third quarter. So we were able to kind of slow them down and get them a little frustrated and, you know, eliminated them one shot. I thought that was big, man. Our rebounds, man, we out rebounded by double, really. And, you know, I thought that was good, you know, to to, to limit one shot and – Kind of, even though we turned it over some, you know, there was times that we really took care of the ball and were able to score. How much does your defense, like, how much does that lead to a, a quarter, like you said, the third, where I think you guys shot over 60%? I mean, you really pulled away. That was the big quarter. How much does just that kind of defense lead to the good offense? 
I think it does. The only problem is in, in, in this game, we didn't press that much. Uh, I can, I can't really remember a lot of times. So, you know, you kind of, you know, again, I have an offensive court and a defensive court and there's a lot of arguments on sometimes we press too much and we wear out their legs. And that's why at the end of the game, we're not making free throws and we're not doing some of the things that we could do better offensively. So it kind of weighs into some of that, but I, th- I feel that, you know, when you're playing really good defense and you're making stops, uh, it helps the offense, and in the half offense, when you score, and it, 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 the tendency to kind of get you going and, and fighting through fatigue and all that on the defensive side. So I think it works hand in hand. But it is when it depends how many people you play in too. You know, when we're playing against Southern Miss, we played seven or eight kids. You know, and you know, we played nine or ten against uh, Texas. Uh, you know, uh, State. So it's it's sometimes different, you know matchups and all that. But we were able to. Uh, to kind of rotate people in and out against Texas State. And I think that helped, too, you know, just keeping them fresh. And uh, Tamara got in foul trouble, and it actually helped her to be a little bit more effective because <laughs> we had to sit her for a while. And, you know, we got, uh, you know, A.B. Uh, Blanton in there, and she did a good job. So we had some we had some help from the bench. Destiny Rice, I mean, she was good. She's been good. I know it was a minutes restriction earlier in the season, but you and I have talked about this young lady a lot over the last year plus and her desire to just want to play big regardless of the moment. It's almost like she likes the pressure, right? Because she doesn't feel it. But, um, you know, she was she was tremendous in this one for you. I think, what, a career high for her maybe in, in scoring? What, is, what does she mean to your squad, Coach? Oh, a lot. I mean, she's a great leader. She was in, she was in the office this morning, first thing, what can we do more, Coach? I mean, like, we're trying to sell this women's sport, you know, and he's, she's in here like, you know, I got to speak at Kiwanis in a, in a couple of days. And, you know, it's like, man, what, what what do we need to portray from my standpoint as an old coach, you know, to the community? And we, she's just, it's not just the game itself. It's every aspect of the sport, you know? So yeah, she just brings the knowledge and she's a coach on the floor big time. She, she sees things that we see maybe sometimes before we see it. So it's a great, and she's a great communicator, you know? Uh, I think, you know, we talked about it on the way back from Texas State on the bus with the fact that she's going to be a great coach, you know, and, no, and that's what she wants. She's no doubt. That's what I want to do, coach. I've been wanting to do it. And, you know, it comes kind of same thing from us when we were growing up, you know, so it reminds, she reminds me of uh, me and Coach Deacon a lot, you know, so, uh, yeah, she just brings, you know, a knowing, you know, what we need to do, not turn the ball over, you know, how how can I get more? She she blames a lot of stuff on her, you know, and that's what we do. You know, I take every loss, you know, so it's kind of like she's trying to figure it out all the time to try to make people better around her. So, yeah, that's all. That's a that's a true, you know, you can't find those true point guards that that much anymore. But that she's a true point guard. How, how you know, how much does her leadership help when you have a loss like you had last week in Hattiesburg? That is. You know, I mean, it's it's heartbreaking, Coach. You're right there. You're on the road. It's tight. It's hard fought. And then it doesn't go your way to bounce back with an authoritative win. You know, how much is it is it key? You know, because you've often told me this, Coach, right? A, a coach can only say so much, but when the players on the team start to say it or a few players start to really echo that message in a loud way, it sounds like Destiny's the kind of player that does that. Oh, no doubt. That's what she does. You know, we talk about, and we talk about all the time, player led, you know, and, um, you know, we've, we've had as coaches this year to do a little bit more, you know, because sometimes it's, it's a motivation too, but she brings that, you know, and she's, she has a way of, uh, and of, of getting kids to understand, you know, when we go on through struggles to say it the right way, that's always the hard thing. You know, it's not the message, but it's sometimes it's the tone that messes everything up. And that's kind of uh, something that she's really, she's really good at, you know. And actually, she's getting better and better at it, you know. That, as a player, you know, sometimes uh, it's hard for them to understand to continue to say and preach the same thing because you're young and it's like, man, I already told them, and they still not, you know. And she's not like that. She's learning that, you know. I got to be able to say it and continue to communicate and she can com- continue to to motivate, you know. So. I think that's what she has in her, you know, the coaches, uh, she got that coach's mindset and all that, but in the right way. And, and you're exactly right, man. It's so much better. I'll be honest with you, man. We have a really good coaching staff, but we also have 
players that are accepting coaching, but they want to also communicate too. You know, I think Coach Sanders brought that to us. I was always struggling in getting them to talk on the floor, and I see a difference now, you know, and I think it's getting better and better, you know. And uh, Coach Sanders has, you know, she's she's pretty good at kind of demanding it where, you know, you know, me and Coach Deacon didn't always kind of demand it as much. So, but, you know, it's just everybody's personality is a little different, and you try to bring that to the game. Coach Gary Broadhead, our guest. Coach, you got South Alabama, you got Troy, Old Dominion, Arkansas State, three of those four at home. The game of Troy's on the road. Just looking at the standings, where these teams are right now in Sunbelt play, this this next four-game stretch, I feel like, across the league, you know, a lot of teams sitting there at two and two. Um, you know, a couple of teams at three and one. It feels like this next four-game stretch, um, albeit while we're still in January, I get it's the early part of the conference schedule, but it, se- it seems like to me over the next two weeks – a lot of separation is going to unfold in the Sun Belt. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, when you're first starting and it's kind of who are you playing and if you're at home and then, you know, what kind of road trip you're going to have, man. I don't. I think it's going to be difficult for uh, people that aren't chartering to be undefeated. I mean, James Madison's undefeated. I think they're the only ones that I know that are chartering. Yeah. I mean, they were there. They were in Southern Miss on thir- on on Thursday before we could even leave on Friday. You know, unreal uh, to play Southern Miss. So that makes a difference. You know, there's going to be the travel. The travel is just crazy. You know, I think basketball is the only sport that'll play Thursday and Saturday in different spots. You know, you play in softball, baseball, you go to that one spot and you stay the whole time. So that's. I mean, the travel might be bad going there, but you stay in there and while you're playing games. So it's, it's, it's going to be tough, but everybody's got to deal with it. So it's going to be difficult for a team to go undefeated. I really believe that. Now, James Madison might be that good, you know, and the way they their athletic department's handling, the way they travel, it may help them, you know. So, they, we'll so see, they, you know? Uh, you're, you're preaching to the choir, Coach. I, I was really harping on this last week as far as, you know, the travel in college basketball and why it's so difficult James Madison women's basketball, they charter all their flights? No, no, all the uh, way I'm going to say, yes. Well, I know they chartered to Southern Miss because they, oh, they were you. there at 1030 that That's night. Cr- and we left, we were in the airport at four in the morning and they, uh, the airport people were like kind of looking at us like, why don't y'all charter like them? We had to get a commercial that flight rest that flew for 15 huge. minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, it's huge. It's going it's to make a difference. And well, they're the only four and old team, so I wonder if it's you know, and I didn't really notice how many to play home, but uh, I know they chartered that flight because the people at the airport told us. You know, yeah, and we're not I sure. How I many think there are some other teams that are going to charter maybe from the East Coast, but uh, I don't. I know there's a lot that aren't. You know, and it's yeah. going to be tough. We need we need travel partners. We need to re re look at how we're going to do this. You know, because to me, it's about the student athlete. You know, their experience and you know. Us coaches, we can lay down anywhere and, and, and not have to run up and down the floor. But, man, that's just tough, you know. I mean, we flew uh, Hattiesburg to Meridian 15 minutes and had to sit on a f- flight for 40 minutes to load up some more people and to get to, uh, to Houston. In Houston, you got to go to Austin, and that's, that's tough stuff, you know, especially with uh, flights right now. Coach Broadhead has been our guest. Rage the Cajun Women's Hoops. Be the Cajun Noma. Thursday as they take on South Alabama, the We Back Pat uh, Alzheimer Awareness Game. Uh, admission is free if you don't have season tickets. Six o'clock tip. Uh, go check out Coach Broadhead, Destiny Rice, the whole crew. It's going to be a uh, a big one, a, a big stretch coming up, man. I, like I said, Coach, we always appreciate you taking the time, man. All the best, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. I really appreciate you, Scott, man. And look, have a good new year and uh, look forward to continuing to communicate about our program. Looking forward to it. All the best. All right. Go Cajuns. All right. Thank you, Coach. We'll talk to Coach Bob Marlin here in 90 seconds. We'll go from the women to the men. We'll circle back to the national title game, Georgia's future. Nick Saban reacting to David Pollock's comment that Georgia is the college football power program right now. And more Jay Walker in the studio in the 8 o'clock hour. Sean Payton rumors, all that on the table. Don't go anywhere. The Great Scott Show continues. Coach Marlin back with me right after this. Don't let someone get your goat. There's plenty to go around for everyone. 
1033 The Goat, the greatest sports talk of all time. Welcome back into 1033 The Goat, simulcast on 1420. Joining me now, the head coach of Louisiana Raging Cajun Basketball, Coach Bob Marlin. Coach, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Coach. How are you? Hey, I'm great, Scott. How are you this morning? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. You, uh, you guys are coming off back-to-back wins um, at home. And, you know, I, I think you said yesterday, Coach, when you opened up your press conference that uh, you said, we're finding ways to win. We're trying to get our rhythm. Where, where do you think your, your team's rhythm is right now at this point in the season, early on in conference play? Well, I think it's in a good spot, uh, Scott. We just have to continue to, to get better and work we need to get better on both sides of the ball uh, we've got a good team and when we we are in rhythm then we're really good because if we're in rhythm on offense we're going to be making shots and that's something we did in the two home games that we did not do on the road and both road games were, were close they were right there but trying to find that rhythm has been key and i know it'll be key coming up here over the next two weeks as your next four are on the road um, in following you guys and listening to the games and seeing a few, Coach, it, it seems like in the wins it's been a mix as far as, like, who's, whose night is it tonight, right? Um, you know, Jordan Brown led all scores. He had 16, and Jordan's done that plenty of times. But in the in the Thursday night win, you know, you got some great outside shooting. Garnett had a career high. It feels like you guys, based on what the opponent's doing defensively, Finding different ways to get offense. You're not necessarily glued to one specific way. Is that how you would you would plan it up, or you know, is that just kind of what is that how you drew it up, or is that just how it unfolded within the game? If that question makes sense. Well, both. I mean, that's the way we want to play, Scott. We want to play fast and get up and down the floor, push the ball. I thought we did a better job of that at home than we did on the road. And then we want to throw the ball inside. We've got the best low post player in the conference, and we need to throw him the basketball. He's getting double and triple teamed every night, and I think he's 18th in the country in free throw attempts. Uh, And he gets doubled. We're going to kick it out, and that's when we need to make outside shots, something Jaden Dalcourt did at a high level and Kentrell this past weekend, and Greg Williams has done it all year. So, Um, And then last, get to this free throw line something we did not do in the first two games. We shot 10 and 12 free throws, and our opponent shot 46. So we got doubled on the two road games, and hence that's why we lose uh, one possession game and a two possession game. Your team's rebounding. I know the uh, the other night it was it was good. I think y'all were double digits in terms of advantage on the glass. A lot of second chance points. How would How do you feel overall about your team's rebounding this season? I think we've done a really good job. Terrence Lewis has really stepped up and helped in that area. Joe Charles played really well the other night and did a lot of things that when he, he doesn't necessarily have to score, he can still impact the game. Uh, of course, Jordan's rebounding better. He's had a couple of double-doubles in the four conference games. So I, I feel good about where we are from a defensive uh, and offensive rebounding standpoint. Coach Bob Marlin, our guest, Louisiana Ragin Cajun Basketball. Uh, playing their next four on the road. You know, I've been talking a lot lately, Coach, on the airwaves about why, you know, winning in college basketball on the road is one of the most difficult things to do in sports, and so much of it isn't about necessarily the the crowd or the dimensions of the arena. While all of that does play a part, I just talk about the travel. And, you know, when you're when you're traveling commercially, you know, by plane or when you're traveling by bus and things, maybe not always just going according to plan, adjusting the schedule, being tired the Thursday, Saturday. It's just a really difficult thing to do. And now you have a stretch early in the season where you play four in a row on the road. What's, you know, I, I know you guys are just going to ULM Thursday, but they've had some um, they've had some, some notable wins so far this season. Then you're at South Alabama. What in your mind is the big key coming up here over these next four road games for you guys to continue your winning ways? Just need to play the best we can play and continue to take good care of the ball. Something we've done to date. We've had less turnovers in every every game than our opponents, and that's a marked improvement over last year. Our defense is better, uh, and 
we've made shots. So we've got to continue to do those things and uh, hopefully get the breaks when we're on the road and just try to fight through it, Scott. But it is a challenge as you go on the road and with the new conference members split weekends. Some weekends we'll, we'll be at home and have to go on the road. Uh, it's just crazy travel. And you talked about Monroe. They opened up at Texas State. They they win a, a game with a shoot twenty something percent. It's crazy, and uh, their their flight got canceled to Memphis, and they had to bus all the way to Arkansas State, and then they shot the cover off the ball, and beat them. So, uh, but the travel's tough. Uh, it, it really is, and we're all trying to navigate it. And there's already been talk among the league coaches that next year we'll try to do something different or use travel partners. Uh, and and see if we you know if we're going to play this schedule, we almost need to do it Wednesday, Saturday instead of Thursday, Saturday. What what you know? How confident are you that 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 could be a realistic possibility in the future? Well, I think it, I think it could happen. Uh, one of our coaches, Scott Cross, does a good job of leading our group. He's a chair of our coaches, and he studies it, uh, and he's pushed to discuss this in the future and all the coaches are on board so it makes more sense from an economic standpoint and from a competitive standpoint coach bob marlin our guest final thing for you coach you mentioned Jalen dowcourt earlier um you know i know he was hot from three-point range uh the other night but just i ask you to highlight a player a little bit if you could tell our audience something about Jalen that maybe they wouldn't know just from watching him on the court well he's got a tremendous personality uh, very big personality and always up, uplifting. Uh, you know, encourages teammates. He's he's the vocal voice of our team as a senior, and he gets us going before practice or in the locker room. Uh, plays with a lot of energy. He's been really focused and had a great year. This is this has been his best year in, in college basketball. Uh, that I've seen, certainly, and uh, I think he'll tell you the same thing. So the future's bright for him. He's just got to continue to to stay with it, and uh, there are going to be moments where he's going to drive the bus. And uh, in our mind, he's a starter. We bring him off the bench, but he comes in and impacts the game, and that's what a substitute's supposed to do. And it seems like, Coach, he kind of embraces that rule of coming off the bench, which every player should do, but, you know, you've coached long enough to know that that's, that's not always the case. Yeah, it's not. And, uh, again, that tells you a little bit about the character of this group. I said it back in the summer when we went to Puerto Rico and in the fall. And we've got a group that that's plays together and plays to win. And they don't, they celebrate each other's success. And Jalen's a big part of that. Coach Marlin has been our guest. Coach, I appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you every Tuesday on these airwaves. All the best. Safe travels. And, uh, Louisiana at Monroe this Thursday, 6.30 tip, 6 o'clock pregame over on our sibling station, News Talk 96.5 KPL. Jay Walker will have the call. All the best, Coach, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Scott. You got it. That is Louisiana Raging Cajun head coach Bob Marlin talking. You know, he didn't use the word chemistry, but he was alluding to it in talking about Dow Court and him embracing his role in uh, – Jay Walker, who is in studio next hour and a little early. What, Jay, what was one of the things Robe said forever about chemistry? Chemistry will make a great team average or an average team great. And and he and 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 you know what? That yes. I mean, how like I use that phrase a lot. Well, and 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 you should. You know, I'm, look, chemistry is difficult for fans because you don't see it. Um, <clears throat> it's an intangible, and so. You know, if you're not going well, and maybe you don't have good chemistry, fans are going, my God, there's so much talent. But, you know, um, but this team has got good chemistry, and I think I think Bob's getting the most out of them. Uh, I think this, I know that this is a team that enjoys going to practice. Um, and, you know, t- traveling with them. I get a chance to spend more time with basketball players than I do the other sports. Because there's so many guys in football, in baseball, you know, you're you're putting all of these, you know, it, it, it's almost impossible to ride the bus, okay? Because because the bus is full. 
But in basketball, you get to travel with them. You ride the bus with them. You you know you you see how they uh, interact with one another, and in in that in that category, this is a special group, man. Uh, and they 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 get on the they get on the bus and 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 they're they're not going to walk by you without fist bumping you, you know, and 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 thing. I mean, they when a team likes each other. It, 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 it can make all the difference in the world. Oh, no, it really can. And you know what? Sometimes it only takes one guy to mess that up. Uh, yeah, yes. And, yes. And, you know, last year they had, you know, they had a couple, okay? Well, one of them, they ran off at the end of the first semester, and the other the other two, they decided that they, they just weren't going to play. And um, And I think that's part of why they were able to make a run at the end of the year. This is uh no this is a group that um uh, they genuinely like each other and and they're they I don't I don't see a whole lot of ego on this team. It makes uh, it, it's true at every level of sport. Mm-hmm. Every level of sport, you know. And if you if you follow a team close enough or you cover a team long enough, you kind of you, you get trained pretty early to be able to tell all right, this team's got good chemistry or something's off. Right. And, 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 you know, you could say it's lip service. I'll just say that when Jay's not constantly talking about how good, I shouldn't say constantly, when Jay's never bringing up chemistry, maybe it's because it's not great. When he's bringing it up a lot, it's because it's real. It's because it's true. Yeah. And, um, you know, I thought, I thought last year's baseball team had great chemistry. Um, that's how you ride out the tough times, too. Yeah. Man. Yeah. You know, and, I'm I'm interested to see what early chemistry is like when I go on the road with softball uh, to that big tournament in Clearwater. Uh, I'll get a chance to see a little bit about chemistry then. Um, but no, this is a this is this is a special group. When you spend as much time as you you spend with each other, one bad apple can make it miserable, it and can, it can spoil the whole bunch, girl. It, 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 it's not like you're just. You know, a few hours around each other, and then that's it. It is when you're traveling a lot. It's it's just totally different. And and I, you know, I, I bring it up talking about the NBA team. I talk about often the Pelicans. I talk about how great their chemistry is right now on this team, and it makes a big difference when you're missing your best players and you still win. When you're traveling, when they're when a guy's a DNP for five games and he gets in, and everyone's going nuts when he makes a bucket because they're so happy for him. When all the guys are, when you start a, a season one and twelve, and at the end you're in the postseason, like getting through those tough times, liking each other, having the right chemistry. If you're building a team, man, you know, I mean, in, in college sports, when you're recruiting, I my thing, Jay, is you do the best you can as far as talking to guys, coaches, and watching them and how they interact and all that. It's that's that's probably a tough thing to be able to tell entirely when you're recruiting somebody if it's going to fit because you only get so much time around them you know right and they've got uh they've got good chemistry right now no doubt about it we're going to take a time out jay walker in studio for the eight o'clock hour talk college football college hoops and more terrible tune tuesday it's all coming your way don't go anywhere it's the great scott show on 103.3 the goat simulcast on 1420 we're back in two minutes mess with a goat. <laughs> You'll get the horns, then the butt. Because <laughs> that's what goats do. 103.3 The Goat. Great Scott! The Great Scott Show. And as they head into the final furlong, all of the other radio stations and radio hosts are left in the wake of a keen turn of speed by the Great Scott Show, the champion! With Scott Prather. Steal the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome into the 8 o'clock hour of the Great Scott Show. In studio, my friend Jay Walker. Hadn't seen him in a while. It's good mm-hmm. to see him in 2023. Yeah, and, 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 and once again, it was not because we were mad at each other. <laughs> I don't know. Jay's only been mad at me maybe once. And Scott's been mad at me once. Yeah. But... 
I don't know. I feel like when you were, I mean, I've known you for 18. I've known Jay Walker for 18 years now. That's crazy. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but like, I feel like your, your fuse was a little more short. Oh, absolutely. Like, like it's it, it, then, than it is now. Oh, there's no question. You know about what it. I mean? No question about it. You know, it's 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 slowly I the was, fuse has gotten longer was, and longer. I with was time. wound a lot tighter. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. My, I guess that's my way of saying. You know, he he's not cantankerous or you know ordinary anymore. <laughs> ordinary <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, yeah. And I, as you know, Jay, it it takes a lot to for me to get upset. Oh, I know. Um, so if I'm mad, then you did something bad. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Once. <laughs> I don't even remember, but but yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you deserved it, whatever it was. Oh no, I did. Uh with that, um, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you in the studio. And um Good Lord. I mean, was was the TCU like do something to, to Kirby Smart's kids? Because that was it wasn't just the most lopsided game in national championship game history. Which it's the most lopsided game of any bowl game ever, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, I now okay. First of all, now and I and and I'm not saying sixty five to seven, okay. But if you didn't see this coming, shame on you, mm-hmm. okay? Because look, there was never a doubt in my mind that Georgia was going to win and they were going to win handily. Now I didn't expect that. Okay. Not 65 to 7. But I did not expect it to be a competitive football game. I thought TCU would get some cosmetic stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought they would probably lose by 20 to 25. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe score 20 points, but Georgia would score like 50. Like, that's what I was expecting. They outgained them by over 400 yards. And, and, you know, and, and you might have had the score that you were just talking about if TCU hadn't turned the football over. But, you know, then they go out and they turn the football over a couple times. And, forget about it. And then forget about it. Uh, but with with all due respect to all of the folks that are fans of that school, they never had a chance. It, it, they just didn't. I'm I, sorry. They just didn't have a chance. I would love to talk to, not today, but like in a few weeks, talk to a, 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 a tried and true TCU fan and say, would you have rather lost a nail biter to Michigan or let it? Because, I mean, look, no one can take away that thrilling win that they had. No, and no one can take away the fact that they got to the national championship. Correct. Game. Correct. Um, you know, I, I think those are things that, you know, after we quit going, but they really got their ass kicked. I, I think that, that that's going to settle in of what they what they accomplished this year. I have a cousin that I'm very close to, and uh, she just got married a um, couple of months ago. Now, she'd been dating the guy for almost a year, and he's a TCU grad. And so when the Cajuns played TCU in the, um, in the, in the regional, they, they had just, I guess, been dating for just a little while. But I got a chance to meet him because she lives out in West Texas, and I was uh, out there for uh, for a personal matter, and um, saw her and and her husband, and of course they had just beaten Michigan, and he was pretty geeked, and and he had a lot of reason to be, and he kept talking about all the reasons he thought TCU would win, and I said, you know what, I just met this guy, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with him. Um, let him, let him, let him, let him have his but, hope. Exactly. Let him have his exactly. False hope. But you know, and but then I talked with um, a friend of mine. Called me yesterday afternoon. He said, "What do you think about tonight's game?" I said, "I, I, I don't think it's going to be close." He said, "I think George is going to slaughter him." I said, "So do I." You know, and so I, um, I think that all of us were hoping against hope that it might be a good game, especially since you just had two good games before that in the in the semifinals. But uh, yeah, no. Sixty-five to seven. Stetson Bennett threw four touchdowns, ran for another two. The former UL commit. Mm-hmm. He um, he's had quite a magical run, and you know he's good, man. In Georgia, I, I think if you're Michigan and Ohio State, you're sitting there watching that game, like, man, what could have been? What could have been? 
And if you're Georgia, I, I think you got to start talking dynasty because you could say, oh, well, they need to win three in a row. Well, no one's, I mean, I, it, it, only Look, uh, only so a few schools have won back-to-backs in the last, you know, 30-plus years. Well, and, and none since we started the college football playoff. Nobody's won it two years in a row. People talk about Clemson as a dynasty of sorts. They've only won two since then. Mm-hmm. They've only won three in their history. Now they were consistently in the mix, and I think right. that's what it takes. But Georgia has been that. It just took them all to finally win the big one, which they did last year. And now they're the they're the betting favorite to win it again next year. And they have a very favorable schedule. Oh next yeah, year. they have to go to Tennessee late in the season. And other than that, they've got a very manageable schedule. Kirby Smart is only forty seven. I know. He looks older than that. He, he seems does. old. He seems older. Than he does. That. He seems older than that. Um, I mean, I mean, he's twenty three years younger than Nick Saban. That's that's something to see. And I'm going to have this up on the website later this morning to see Nick Saban's face on that set when David Pollock, former Bulldog, said the Georgia Bulldogs are the they have they're taking over college football. They are the power. And seeing Saban just kind of have to sit there and take it. It mm-hmm. was uh he looked he looked pretty sad. Oh I I'm he looked pretty sad. I'm sure. Um, it, it was it was funny. I laughed. Mm-hmm. I laughed. I'm not a Bulldogs fan. I'm not, I'm certainly not a Bama fan, but I just it was uh that's that's a tough thing to sit there and he couldn't say anything. I mean Georgia's up thirty eight seven. They've they won last year and um and they won again this year. And it was uh, just a, a completely dominant performance and not one that was... I, I don't know what the ratings were. My guess is a lot of people probably turned it off. I didn't watch that thing start to finish. I was kind of watching the Pelicans and other stuff and doing dad stuff and was flipping. And, you know, I watched the early part and I saw what I needed to see. I was like, yeah, this is over. This is done. If you're TCU, I... I I think that with time, like you said, Jay, you'll, they'll easily be able to look back at this and say, man, what a great ride. Um, when you lose the way you did, it's hard to do right now. And I think it's different than – I brought up 2011 LSU and how they beat everyone, dominated everyone with the exception of Bama, a close win on the road, and uh, – Thought they'd play Oklahoma State. BCS says, no, it's going to be Bama. And just, it was 21 to nothing. It might as well have been 40 to nothing. I mean, it was it was, it was was an authoritative, dominant win. LSU fans don't look back at 2011 and say, man, what a great year. Because, no, they don't. because of that. Correct. TCU, I think, will eventually be able to do it, even though they didn't even win their conference. Because they were five and seven last year, they were unranked, so it was kind of house money. No one expected us to be here. I think if it wasn't TCU and it was Texas, it's Texas, Texas University, not University of Texas, not Texas Christian University. I I don't think that they could do that. But because it's TCU, I think with time they'll be able to say. But well, that was a pretty magical ride. Yeah, because it's never happened with them in modern history, and there's no guarantee it's ever going to happen again. You know, you 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 dismissed your other coach. You didn't make a splash hire. You hired Sonny Dykes, and all he did was go from from Dallas over to Fort Worth uh, to take over. And 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 it's not that Sonny Dykes isn't a good football coach. He is, but it, it's it's. That, that, there was no oh wow factor when that man was uh, named head coach. And you're right. They didn't win their conference. And here's something that, that maybe you should have thought about while you were beating the, the TCU bandwagon. In that game, they had first and goal at the one, ran it four times and couldn't get it in. Okay? That's how they lost that game to Kansas State. Mm-hmm. So... You know, they're, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they had, they had a great run. They had a, they had a tremendous win over Michigan. Tremendous. We were in a restaurant in Norfolk. Is that where we were? Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, and I'm with the team, you know, and everybody orders food. And there's some people at the bar that are Michigan fans. They're wearing Michigan attire. And they, it, because, look, there are a lot of ups and downs in that game. If you had a, if you had a dog in the hunt. And just just watching them like get all excited and then just get all pissed and just that uh, it was it, it was good entertainment. Was I, I'm good sure it was because they're feeling like holy cow if this or if that. There's like eight plays they're saying if only that had changed we could have won. Well, you didn't. Odds for next year per DraftKings: Georgia plus two seventy five. Ohio State. Wait, I'm sorry. Let me go in order here. Alabama plus five hundred. Ohio State plus 800, Michigan plus 1,000, USC and Clemson plus 1,400, LSU plus 1,800, Tennessee plus 2,000, along with Florida State. You got to go pretty far down the list before you get to TCU that's at plus 6,000. Um, I'll tell you the one team that's being undervalued of the ones that you just said, and that's Florida State. I think I think Florida State has a chance to get into the college football playoff next year. Do you? Yes. Why? Because in the second half of the year, they were one of the best teams in college football, and they've got lots of folks back. They have uh, Norvell has recruited well. Um, I I think they're a dark horse. I I, I think they're going to be a team that people are going to say. Well, yeah, they're going to be pretty good, but nobody's going to be talking about being one of maybe the top four teams in America, but I think they're going to have a shot. Of the ones I mentioned, by the way, let's throw two more in there. Texas is plus 2,200. Notre Dame's plus 2,500. Of those 11 teams, who's the most overvalued? Uh, N- Notre Dame. It's, al- it's always Notre Dame, dude. It's always Notre Dame. Plus 1,400 at USC. I mean, um, look, I, I know they're going to score a lot of points, but, like, can they win a national championship with Lincoln Riley? As we saw last night, you need defense to win it all. They, they, well, they, you know, they can get into that, that final four mix. Look, and, and, and I'm going to say this. Once you get into the college football playoff, anything can happen. Well, you just said before that TCU had no shot and you knew it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but... <laughs> Um, but they got to the championship game, which nobody expected. What if they had played Ohio State? How would that a game? How would that game have played out less? I think on on that particular night, I think Ohio State would have won the game. I think the matchup was a little bit better against Michigan. Um, but you know, they're just look. Ohio State was one Stetson Bennett pass away from playing for it all. One field goal. Well, yeah, and, and I'm not going to get on that guy because it's 50 yards, okay? But he nailed the 48-yarder just a few minutes before, and that one looked like Will Lutz cook kicking on Sunday. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man, the Saints season just mercifully came to an you end. You know, yesterday we're, we're at uh, Coach Marlin's got his media availability, okay? And there's somebody there that's just starting to ri- – and it wasn't Kevin – just railing about Sunday's game. And I said, dude, what are you doing? Have Had they gone out and beaten Tom Brady the, the day that they were supposed to? Right, the Monday and, night and, game and yesterday, and, and, and the then, Sunday's game would have had so much on the line. Yeah, then, then you get really ticked off because they lost. But, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to go on a rail for a game that all it did – was instead of playing the Cowboys next year, you're going to play the Giants because instead of playing the second place teams, you're going to play the third place teams. Instead of playing the Dolphins, you'll play at New England, and instead of playing the Seahawks, you'll play the uh, at the Rams. Um, you get the Giants at home, and your dra- You know the Eagles got a tenth pick overall instead of what you know what I'm saying, right? But to your point, it really it it was annoying, but I wasn't. Angry? No. Like I would like let me that Monday night game. It was about the most heated I ever got on the radio. Was the next morning. I, I know. Mean, I, it, I, I I was out there talking to me to just, me moon and, and you were just. Like, it was the it. worst. No, Sunday was just annoying. But the reality is, it was just apropos. It was like, well, yeah. of course, 
This is what they do, and this is who in they the are. final game of the season. Just hold a, a quarterback to forty-two yards passing, five of fifteen, two picks, and somehow lose the game. That that was the 2022 Saints on Sunday, man. Who you like in the playoffs here, Jay? <sighs> NFC seems weird in in wide open for various reasons. The, yeah. the AFC feels a lot more stacked but also that tells you that it's it could be i mean look miami's not going to do anything with respect but uh and i don't think seattle's going to do anything but if you look at the the six seeds one through six in each conference you could make you can make a case for and against anyone no you can't try me no you can't try me i i'm i I saw the matchups for super wild card weekend Oh, we got super wild card. We and I looked and I said, "God, all of those games look boring." Um, now, I don't think I don't think, now, ja- I don't think Jacksonville's going for the record. I, I, you know, I think the Jacksonville game might be the game that I'm most intrigued by because the, because look, I'm, I'm telling you, the Giants ain't going to go to Minnesota and win. I don't know. They almost did just a few weeks ago. I, but, but they're not going and to. Minnesota I'm just, is I'm just here to tell you the that's worst, not going to happen. The worst four-loss team of all time. I, um, you know, uh, 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 Dallas Dallas at Tampa. See, in the NFC, I could, I can, ESPN I can, hit the mother load with that one. I can make a case, which I was like, how did, how did they get that and not Fox? I don't know what the pecking order is, but I'm like, if Fox chose New York, Minnesota instead of Dallas, Tampa, what? E- a- ABC must have had some kind of ESPN must have had the the, the pecking order. I think there. I think the NFL might have gotten involved in that, but but who knows? But to answer your question, okay, the team that intrigues me the most and the team that I think is going to represent the NFC is San Francisco. With a third-string quarterback. With a third-string quarterback. Because they have the best defense in football. And I just think that as long as Brock Purdy doesn't go out and get his team beat, they're going to play in the Super Bowl. We will see. I mean, the NFC now, is the, open. Now, the AFC is, is look, I can make you a case for Buffalo and Kansas City and Cincinnati. I'll make a case I think, for everyone but Miami. Okay, I'm I'm stopping after the first three. Baltimore, the case is if Lamar plays. That's the case. If Lamar Jackson comes back, they're a different team. That's the that's the only yeah, case. But, but can they go out and beat Joe Burrow? If they have Lamar Jackson, sure. Maybe. I'm not I, I'm not predicting I mean, I'm to, it. I'm totally okay with it. I'm not pre- I'm not predicting it. No, no, Cincinnati's playing the best at the right time. Buffalo, I think if if the the DeMar Hamlin situation ever happens, they're probably the one seed because I don't care that they were down seven to three. I think they would have won that game. And maybe mm-hmm. they wouldn't have. Maybe maybe it'd be Cincinnati as a two. Um the Chiefs are the Chiefs. I mean, Patrick Mahomes has never played a road playoff game. He's played neutral fields and suit never played a road playoff game. It's gonna be weird when there's a neutral field in the AFC title game, by the way. Um and then, you know, the Chargers always on paper, it's like, huh? They'll they'll charger it up. They'll mess it up. Mm-hmm. But they're always like, if they beat Jacksonville and they're playing a familiar opponent in Kansas City, I could see a scenario where there's an upset there. I don't see the Chargers getting all the way to the Super Bowl. But like, and the AFC, everyone but Miami, because I guess if Tua plays, they're a different team. But like, they're, no, no. I watched happening. I watched a good part of their game Sunday and, and or Saturday, whenever it was. And and I'm just here to tell you that without Tua, watching Miami plays like going to the dentist. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. they, that's just painful to yeah. watch, man. Yeah, I mean they were eight and three and finished nine and eight and almost finished eight and nine. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, uh, they're they're just they're the only team out there that I'm like they're they're if you're if you're Seattle or Miami, you're kind of like we're we're happy to we're just glad we made it. Based on what our record was, but the other ones, man, man, I'll tell you, I was really rooting for Seattle not to win. Oh, me too, because I wanted to oh, see the too. Lions get so the bad, so bad, dude, they, so bad. I, I, I was, and then you watch them on on Sunday night. It was the best game of the the whole weekend, and you're like, God, if they were just, how much sweeter would it be if they were also going to the playoffs yeah, right now? Yeah, Dan Campbell breaking out all the stops, and he. 
it says a lot about that guy that his team was eliminated from the playoffs right before that game started, and he had them still just as amped. He's like, all right, if we're not going, they're bleeping not going either. And the team was like, damn right, coach. Well, and it helped that they were playing the Packers. Absolutely. Okay? I mean, that made, it made it kind of easy for Absolutely. them to get Absolutely, that was the But point, they were still yeah. playing at Lambeau. You know, on and, Sunday and, night. And on a Sunday night, I'd... You know, kudos to them. You know, I you remember early last year, the Lions lost, I don't know, three or four gut-wrenching games. So many close ones. And and Dan Campbell got up and he started praising his guys and he started crying. And Man. I and I said, I said, you know, I said, I can I can embrace this guy and I can embrace that team. And then I said, boy, this year they're going to be good. And they started one and six. One and six. And I'm going, geez, I, I wasn't expecting this. I expect them to be better. And then all of a sudden here they came down the back stretch. You know, uh, that may be the team that I adopt next year. We talk you about know? chemistry. That team, to be one and six, not just one and six, to be one and six and be the Lions. Yeah. To climb out of that and finish with a winning record. Uh, they deserve, they give them all their flowers. They deserve it. And uh, Dan Campbell deserves it. And keeping that team together, man, they're going to be hopefully a fun team next year. It'll be rare for them because there'll be expectations, even though they weren't even in the playoffs. That We'll see how they handle that. But I'm with you, man. I was, you know, I mean, it didn't involve the Saints, and yet I was sitting there, and I knew they couldn't even go to the playoffs. And I'm, I'm like, come on, come on, go get it. Go get it, guys. They're, um... God, the Lions, man. What it must be to be a tried and true Lions fan. I mean, you've you've been through some some painful stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that Sunday night, despite the fact that you're not in the postseason, had to feel and a and sweet. and I do know somebody who's a real Lions fan, and um, he's you know even even though they didn't, I saw him make a Facebook post after the game you know, after they beat Green Bay. He was pretty happy. It's it's the, the final Sunday is always odd because even teams some teams get in and yet it's like uh, I'm not sure like Baltimore's going in they might have to start Anthony Brown like it's like we, we're going to play Cincinnati then you've got teams like the Bears who had the worst record in the league and they're thrilled because they lost in in Lovey Smith their old coach who they still love gets Texans to win so they have the first so they're terrible and yet they're happy. Saints fans are miserable. Um, you you get it kind of all over the all over the map there. Playoffs starting last year, the Super Wild Card weekend only gave us I think like one good game. Then the following weekend, it was just all amazing stuff. Is that going to happen again this year? We'll see. Well, you know, what what are, what, are, what do they call that round? The division round, right? The division round last year was epic. The division round is always the best weekend. It always is. And you have NFL football all day Saturday and Sunday, and so there's not like this this rest or we've only got two games. And and I think there's there's something about knowing if you're like a hardcore NFL fan, once you get past the divisional round, that post football depression it's not it hasn't sunk in yet but it's on the it's right there you're like there's only 3 games left and then we got to wait till next there's only 3 games left before the divisional round it you're you're not quite feeling it yet speaking for speaking to somebody who who really enjoys the NFL but uh, I hope we get some I hope we at least get one big surprise this weekend it even it, even if it's not who wins or loses just the fact that it's a a, a great game that we're not expecting now, Dallas and Tampa Bay, let me ask you this, Jay. You got Tampa, who's not good, um, who doesn't, you know, have a winning record, who, if their O-line is intact, they can do some things. If not, they're in a lot of trouble. And then you have Dallas, who had a good season, but hasn't won a road playoff game in the 21st century. I mean, if Cowboys fans think they're about to go win three straight road games in the playoffs, they're fooling themselves. You have the Cowboys who are who are better than Tampa Bay, period. And yet, uh, they have a history, in the 21st century anyway, just of, in the big moments, not getting it done. Right. In the big moments where they're supposed to win, not getting it done. 
I, I think they're better than Tampa Bay. If they lose this game and there is, let's just say, a a Mike McCarthy gaffe that is big enough to where everyone's discussing it, like what is he thinking, would they fire him? Is his is his is there a scenario where despite the fact that Dallas had a really good season, he could get fired Absolutely. Tuesday? Absolutely. And the reason I say that is because Sean Payton can stick his head around the corner and say, That's Hey right. Jerry, That's, how are you? That's where I was going with this. Absolutely. Sean Payton, Denver's interviewed him. Arizona, little interest, but they're reportedly more interested in Van Joseph. Sean Payton has orchestrated by design, his exit plan from New Orleans and getting another gig to perfection. He Watching him on Fox Sunday answer these questions with such ease, pamper up the guys on the set with you, make a joke, be somewhat... There's not one thing I'm particularly looking for. I'm looking for good ownership. That's that's the most important thing. Well, every owner feels like they're good. Mm-hmm. So he's already kind of pampering them up. He's out there looking for the payday. He didn't want to stay in New Orleans, but he didn't want to get messy. He was under contract. So he leaves. He throws a big party for the local media on his own dime. Well, they're all writing nice stuff about him. And you know what? They should, because he did things in New Orleans that no one had ever done. He And he, no one may never do right. again. It, he, he deserved it, but it was like, I'm sorry for all the times I was a jerk. Let's, let's have a big party. Mm-hmm. So you leave on these really glowing terms. The fan base is grateful. You just missed out on the playoffs last year when everything went wrong and you still had them fighting. So you kind of leave, even though you didn't get in the playoffs, it was like a winning record. It was like, man, they fought hard. Good for him. You go in the media, so you're talk you're 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 in the limelight every week. The Saints struggle from a coaching standpoint. Well, that helps him too. He has played this thing perfectly. And anytime he's asked about it, he has his representatives leak stuff. Well, you know, Sean, if he was hired, he's already looking at Vic Vangio and he's already doing this. This is all his representatives. He is going to go somewhere. He's gonna have a couple of choices, and he is going to get paid handsomely and Saints fans aren't going to be upset about it because they'll get a little draft pick. They're not going to be mad because it's not going to be a team in the NFC South. He's just, if you wanted to leave a city that loves you and a team and a fan base that loves you, that's the way to do it. Absolutely. And you know, and, and look, I want him to get another gig because I want the Saints to have a first round draft pick for the NFL draft. And I want them to take that draft pick and the following year's draft pick and trade them to Chicago and then go get the number one pick in the draft <laughs> and go get me a damn quarterback. They would need they would need something higher than would Den- so Denver owns San Francisco's pick, first round pick. You think they're going to the Super Bowl, so if that's the case, then you're looking at thirty one or thirty two. No, I, I'm not looking at Denver. Who are you, who, who are you looking at? No, I'm, I'm. I don't think he's going to Denver. I don't think he wants to go to Denver. They got that Walmart money. Yeah, I know. I think here's here's the the one other thing I'll say. Everyone keeps saying well, he wants to go to a place with a quarterback. He wants to go to ownership, and and I think, I think those things are not at the top of the list. What's at the top of the list, even though he's not saying it, is the money. Who's going? If I'm not even kidding. If he had a chance, as much as he wants to go to the Chargers, let's say Staley screws up and they they lose Saturday and they actually fired someone. If the Texans were like, Sean, that's cool and all, we're going to pay you four mil more per year. He's going to Houston. When he gets asked about the Bounty Gate season, which was ridiculous that he was suspended for a year, but he didn't have a union to defend him and he had to sit there and take it. Every time he was asked about it, to this day, what what... What was the hardest thing about it? it? He never says, man, just being away from the guys or missing out on a year of Drew Brees and his prime. Or blah. He always says, that guy took $8 million from me. Every time. It, the highest bidder, I think, ultimately is going to get Sean Payton above anything else. And that's part of why, oh, I mean, it's going to be about strong ownership. Go ahead and butter up the owners because they all. there's not an owner out there that thinks that they're not good at their job. I, I Look, I don't care where Sean Payton goes. 
I want the Saints to take that draft pick <laughs> and then the following year's draft pick, trade them to Chicago or, and get the number one pick. And look, and, and if and if Chicago doesn't, because look, Chicago is not going to keep the number one pick. They're not. They're going to trade it. Maybe. Because they, they don't need a quarterback. And everybody is going to want to go and get Bryce Young. Now, you know, if it's if it's not Bryce Young, you probably still got two other quarterbacks that are uh, top ten draft guys. So I'm, you know, that's what I want to see happen because I, you know, I'm. I don't think they can address it in free agency, and God bless Andy Dalton for coming out and 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 working hard and having his moments and having some you know some some days where he was pretty doggone good. Andy Dalton is. At best, a capable backup. Or a transition quarterback. Like if 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 the Saints, let's say they let's say they, they don't get as high as you you say you want them to, which I think that'd be difficult. But let's say they end up getting a first rounder and they get a guy like maybe it's not young or CJ Stroud, but like Will Levi. Like he I think he's projected to be the next QB on the board. I could see them saying one year deal, Andy. You you know what you're here for. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and then Levi, you know, has a little time to to transition or whatever. But <sighs> it ain't gonna be Ian Book, okay? Well, Ian, Ian Book's not with Door. He's actually in Philly. There you go. Got C.J. Gardner Johnson sitting there trashing the Saints. They're getting ready for the playoffs as the one seed. Although, if you're the Eagles, you got the buy. You're the one. Jalen Hurts was was great this year. When he got hurt, you were a different team. And we saw what the Saints did to him uh, nine days ago. Yeah. They handled him. You play him in a game against the Giants team that was essentially resting because they, they couldn't improve their seed one way or another. So they weren't trying to win the game. Philly has to break out Hurts to make sure they win so they win the division. He still looks a little nicked up. Should the Eagles be a little worried even though they're the one seed? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't... Um... I don't know that the the Eagles are, you know, their defense is good, but their their defense is good, but I don't know that they're head and shoulders above anybody. Um I think I think that the NFC is kind of wide open. I told you I like San Francisco. Um you know, over on the other side, look, there's one of three teams that's going to play in the Super Bowl. It's going to be Cincinnati or it's going to be Buffalo or it's going to be Kansas City. I mean, that it, it, there's there's not even a conversation there. Yeah, not, not feeling the Jags, huh? You don't think they're going to go on a Bengals-like run? Uh, yeah, no. They were two and six at one point. I know. Doug Peterson's a good coach, yeah, evidently. How bad is Urban Meyer? <laughs> oh man, you know, uh, Doug, Doug Peterson. I I won't be surprised if he winds up being the coach of the year in the NFL this year. Yeah. Got a uh, a message here from a listener. Josh says, a few weeks ago, Mike Florio wrote a piece about the possibility of Sean coming back to New Orleans. Is that preposterous? Uh, I think so. No, Sean's not going back to New Orleans. If he wanted to be in New Orleans, he would be in New Orleans. He's not. He needs to. Any story out there that that makes him more desirable, that could drive up an asking price, again, people that think Sean's more worried about the next team he goes to not having a first-round draft pick, if you think he's more worried about that than his paycheck, you're wrong. There you go. Um, and I also think when it comes to Florio, there's there's two, there's two things with Florio. One, when he's reporting when he's reporting something like my sources say this isn't a possibility. When he's saying this is happening, you could take it to the bank. And I I actually respect Florio because he was the only person when the NFL was feeding all of the Bounty Gate BS. He was the only guy that was somewhat of a noted. NFL writer that was like something smells really off here like you're telling me this NFL can you also answer this did this guy really say this and and he was basically saying guys there are a lot of inaccuracies here so I respect him for that but for Florio if he anytime he's saying hey this has been discussed he's just going for the he's going for the clicks like the pro football talk was who started the there could be eight playoff teams this year in each conference because of what happened in Cincinnati. While I don't doubt that maybe the owners brought it up, there's no way they seriously considered it ever. But if you're a writer and you're Florio, you're like, we're going to put that this was 
one of the discussions. They're not lying, but that's the thing. They got the most clicks, the most discussions. So I think writing about Peyton, maybe going back, I think that's Peyton's representatives. I, I don't, yes, I'll go ahead and use the word preposterous. He's not coming back to New Orleans. They're not firing Dennis Allen as much as many of you would like that to happen. It's not going to happen, and Allen's going to be the coach next year. Boy, best description I saw of Dennis Allen. My friend Ralph said that his wife saw him on TV and said, he looks like a dad at CVS confused about what medicine to buy for his kids. That is what Dennis Allen looks like. You ever go to a CVS? I mean, I've been that guy before. It's like you got a list. You're like, all right, they got a cough. It's not, what am I supposed to get here? Like, hi, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to that's, get help and I that's can't. That's not the analogy I'd have come up with, um, but but yeah, I get it. It's, it's, it's spot on, I'm telling you. No, it's spot on, but. For, you got a better one? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, is, it, is, it, is it radio friendly? Uh, but, yeah. All yeah. right, well, let's hear it. You know, you, it's not cough medicine he's looking for. It's tampons, okay? Oh, my God. And and the, the first time that your that your daughter oh and you got to go and you got to go to CVS and or, or, or wherever, and then you get things. You know, okay, well, damn, odds are good. And then you see, and and then they even tell you the brand. And then and then you look at the brand and it's got like five sub brands. And, and <laughs> oh no, no, it's no, 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 no. That's bad. bad I got bad, bad, bad. I got I got Now that you've gone there, I have a story. I, um, you know, I, I'm not as old as you, Jay, but I am old enough that I was of a generation that you could get your driver's license at 15 years old. So I was 15 and I was, my parents would let me drive some, but not like anywhere all the time. And I don't remember the situation. One of my sisters needed some tampons and there was stuff going on with the family and, and no one could get there. My mom was just like, you can drive to K and B and you can go. You, 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 we, and I was just like, no, I, I was back then. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And they were like, do it. Like, this isn't a request. You have to go do it, whatever. And I remember just, I don't know. I didn't know. I just got a, I got a box and I went and there was this woman, this cashier at K and B. I mean, I'm 15. I'm like goofy haircut, hundred pounds dripping wet and, um, probably a bad fake earring. And I'm getting these checking out and I'm like, She's kind of looking at me. I'm like, they're not for me. You know, they're for my sister. Honest to God, the woman looks at me and goes, sure, that's what they all say. And I was like, "Who? who's they? Does this happen? Off? Wait, what? What? And to this day, it didn't make any sense to me. Like, that's what they all say. Like, what does she think that, like, men go there to buy that for any other reason than it's for someone else? Like, I, I don't, I don't, I, what? Yeah, that doesn't make what? any sense. That's, I guess that's why she worked at KMB. It was, it was, it was. Have some respect, Jay. All right, that's uh, that's how we're going to transition to terrible Tune. Tuesday, terrible tampon. All right, nope, we're not doing it. Back after this. For those of you listening via the podcast on demand, we uh, cannot play terrible tune Tuesday for you uh, due to some licensing agreements. But thank you for listening to the Great Scott Show. Thank you for subscribing. If you could please leave a nice review, rate it. That'd be great. Hope you all have a wonderful day. This is the Great Scott Show from 1033 The Goat, simulcast on 1420 The Goat, the greatest sports talk of all time.